Good afternoon, guys. As usual, it's a pleasure to be back here with you in our continuation of our topic when evil altars are raised against churches. But this, of course, is part six. All right. Now, I, I gave you some homework, and that homework was for you to read uh, Exodus, I think it was 22, 23, 24. And I would like to think that you did that. And the reason why I wanted you to read it, because there are parts of these scriptures that I'm going to skip for the sake of time. So I will be giving a summary of some of those scriptures. Now, if you had read the scriptures, you will know exactly uh, where I'm excuse me, coming from. Nevertheless, excuse me, if you haven't, then you'll be lost. Okay, now let me just check here to make sure all of my levels are up. And once I would have confirmed that, then we're going to jump right into this teaching. So let me put up Facebook here on my iPhone. Because everything here is fine on the iPad, but let me just confirm here to make sure everything is good. Okay, here we go. Beautiful. Okay, great. So I assume everybody can hear me. So I have to check you on my iPad because when I'm looking here on my, sorry, I have to check you on my iPhone. Because when I'm looking here on the iPad, where I have all my levels. Sometimes they don't correspond with what's going on with Facebook. So based on what I'm seeing here, you guys, uh, Shakita Dean, okay, good afternoon, teacher and classmates. <laughs> good afternoon to you too. <laughs> Shakita is extremely faithful to these teachings. I love her. I thank God for her. And uh, clearly she's learning a lot. She's learning quite a bit here. Okay, here we go. I see some little uh, interference here. Okay. Okay, let's get to this teaching. Okay, now today. Today is part six. Today is part six of when evil altars are raised against churches. And so far we've covered quite a bit. For those of you who are... Uh, tuning in for the first time, I strongly suggest that you go over the other five and it's just the series. You can either look at them here on Facebook and uh, it's a very easy search. Just type into your search bar when evil altars are raised against churches and it will pull up the five that we did already. Or you can go to my YouTube page, channel, sorry, and uh, also put in Kevin L.A. Ewing. Uh, when evil altars are raised against churches, and of course it will pull up all of those uh, in there for you so that you can watch it at your your pleasure. Today is going to be awesome. Today is packed with revelatory insight. I was so excited this morning about this teaching, and I don't think you guys can imagine how excited I get. I love teaching. This this is my gift. I love this. I love this with a passion. I could do this all day, <laughs> honestly, because... And that's one of the good things. Let me just do this little thing here before I get into it. In fact, I was led to say this. A lot of you right now are miserable with your life. You're, you feel unfulfilled. You feel you might have married the right person. You might have been praying for. You finally get the promotion you were looking forward to. But there's still this incomplete part of the Christians now. I'm talking to those who have already accepted Christ. And really what that incomplete you're not doing, what you do. See, that's going to be a problem. See, you are doing what you are called to do. It isn't a job anymore. No, 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 no. You don't see it as frustrating. You don't see it as people nagging you or these people getting on your case. No. This is what you are called to do. And because you are called to do this, then by deep within, you look forward to doing it. So there's someone or many people out there today, you need to, if you don't know what your gifts are, ask God, what, God, what is it that you, what talents have you given me? A lot of you know. But more than likely, you're probably using it for the wrong purposes. But begin to walk in your gift, man. I'm telling you, it's very, very rewarding. It's very fulfilling. I speak from experience. Uh, my gift, personally, has opened many doors for me and continuing to open doors for me. Uh, every other week, honestly, I'm, I'm being invited to come and minister somewhere. And a lot of them I have to turn on because I, I have a current job, so it's difficult for me to squeeze those times in. Now, I do have three uh, 
conferences coming up where I'll be the guest speaker. Uh, one is at the end of this month, from the 28th to the 30th, we'll be in Grand Cayman. My wife and myself will be, be doing teachings on altars, and that's I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be an awesome time. In fact, this weekend we're going to be doing a short video clip uh, to promote that event. Next month I'll be in Avion, Florida. I will be doing a uh, two two or one day conference. In fact, I have all of this stuff on my Facebook page. Then the month after that, that's going to be in uh, June. June, I think it's June, right? Yeah, Heather, put a little note down there, or put the uh, flyer down there. Heather or Frank Anderson, pastors, beautiful people. I'm looking forward to us in New Jersey. We're going to be up there. I just got an invitation, two of them, for Houston, Texas, and Ontario. Canada. If you guys are watching me, I haven't responded to you. I've really been tired about emails, but I'm definitely going to respond to you today so we can lock in those dates. So I'm telling you out there, your gift will make room for you just like the scripture says. <clears throat> I've never once asked anybody to mount their pulpit. I've never once asked anyone to send me money. I've never sold any miracle cloths or miracle oils. I've done none of that. All I did was exercise the gift of God, which is teaching, extracting revelation, understanding, wisdom, and insight from the scriptures, and giving it to the people of God. As a result of that, as a result of that, the Lord has opened doors for me. The Lord has granted me favor and blessing. So this is not bragging. What I'm doing here is encouraging you. You're probably broke because you're not using your gift. You're probably frustrated because you're not doing your, using your gift. You're probably... Things are not happening the way you want it to happen simply because you're not doing using your gift. Use your gift. You see what I do? I don't have to be on a pulpit. I do it right here on my porch. In fact, I'm doing a video tomorrow. Well, you, the, the view that I'm going to give you guys tomorrow is going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. I'm not going to tell you where it's going to be, but you will see tomorrow. Okay, I'm going to do a video tomorrow, but it's not going to be on my porch. It's going to be in a lovely island, Grand Bahama. But nevertheless, get up. Get up and start working your gift. You know many people write me hate mails and say, why you always got to be on Facebook and YouTube? Why are you always speaking about this? Why are you, why are you worried? Why are you concerned? <laughs> but again, these are agents of the devil trying to distract you, trying to pull you away from what you're called to do. You will be equally as responsible as they are if you succumb to them. No, I don't. In fact, I tell them all the time, I invite them because it says to me, you're watching me. Yeah, you're watching all of my videos and this is how you are so detailed in reiterating them to me in your criticizing of me. So I, I welcome it, man. I welcome it. Start wherever you are. If God called you to sing, if God called you to, to be a tailor, whatever God has called you to do, you need to start somewhere. Once you start, the Lord thy God, whom has already made the pathway straight for you, will send the right people to you, the people who was assigned to your life to move you to the places you need to be to display the gifts and talents that God has given you. So I'm making an appeal to you. Stop sitting back and saying, oh, I too shy. Oh, I'm afraid. I used to be... I used to be one of the most fearful people ever. I grew up with a spirit of fear. I couldn't sleep with the lights off at night. As I began to grow older, public speaking and stuff, man, if someone said, Kevin, I need you to speak something publicly, man, listen, that's like someone, uh, you know, <laughs> trying to drive me crazy because the fear would literally paralyze me. I remember praying consistently, asking God to remove that fear. And I know how I got it, but that's a different teaching. Asking God to remove the fear, the anxiety, the worry, the panic attack. I remember years back before I ever got into public speaking, I used to imagine it a lot, what it would be like. And to be honest with you, even when I heard myself on recording, I used to be so, like I couldn't accept what I heard. Like I sounded so terrible to me. But as I grew old and get into the Word, I realized that that was the enemy once again making another attempt to squash the efforts I was trying to make and close the doors where God had already opened for me. Closed in the sense that he didn't want me to go through those doors. But as I prayed, and I'm going to be honest with you, I prayed, and I asked God to remove it. Now, how God is going to work in that area, you have to make the first step. He has already made the way straight. So I remember one time I had a speaking engagement uh, to, to 
a, a college. They had asked me to come and speak. I don't think people ask me to speak. What do they want me to speak for? They don't know me. <laughs> but of course, and I love this, God will allow others to see in you what you can see in yourself. You know, I made a, a teaching on that the other day. So anyway, I went there and man, listen, let's say they told me that like about two months before the event. Well, for the entire period from the time they told me that all the way up to that event, I mean, I was a nervous wreck. But every night I prayed, I say, Lord, please, if you would only take this anxiety, this panic attack away from me, I, I, just remove it because it really disabled me. Anyway, I remember writing out my speech and everything, you know, crossed all my T's, dot all my I's. And I remember there were a few people before me who had to come and, you know, do little stuff here and there. And they said, our guest speaker for tonight, the one and only Mr. Kevin. That time while they calling all of these stuff off, my heart is just racing at 66 trillion miles per hour, right? I mean, honestly, if you had put your hand on my chest, you would feel my heart pounding. And at the same time, the enemy was just putting nonsense upon nonsense in my head. Man, you see these educated people here with degrees and master's degrees. But they get your dumb self off this table, man. What you doing foolishness on here? Nobody will listen to you. And <laughs> even though I'm laughing now, it wasn't no laughing matter then. But I remember praying right there just before they called me up. I say, Lord, help me. Take this. If you take this away from me tonight, I will be unstoppable for you. This was my words. I remember when I got up, I walk up, my nice black suit and everything on, I walk up there and I say, good night. And my heart is pounding and I'm not going to lie to you, I'm going to tell you the truth. This God is a real God. I felt whatever that fear was I had prior, it was like something came there and ripped it off of me. And I developed this confidence like nobody. Let me know how confident I became. I'm going to get to the teaching right now. I became so confident. I didn't even use my speech. I took my speech in and rested down. I came in front of the, the podium and stand as if I'm some uh, expert, uh, what's the guy named Les Brown. And I stood there and I, my thoughts just began to flow. And I'm talking in a concise manner, no tripping over my words. You would think I was doing this for years. Two things I learned from that. Two very valuable lessons, and I'm helping someone today. I'm going to get into the teaching, but I'm helping someone who needs to get into their gifts. The first thing I learned in that is that you have to make us, you've been praying, you've been fasting, but you're saying, but the fear is still there, the anxiety. Right, it's there until you make the first move. When you step out and make that first move, the Lord thy God is with you. The God of peace, the God who did not give you the spirit of fear is with you, and he's going to rip that off of you. That's the first thing I learned. The second thing that I learned in that one night, which launched me to where I'm at right now in terms of public speaking, is the fact that when you commit yourself to the things of God, you don't have to sit down and try to remember everything you want to say in order to seem or to appear or to sound perfect. Remember what I told you? When I got up there, I had my speech. I had like a three, four page speech. And I rest that speech down and I walked in front of that podium, whatever, and I began to take my time and speak, because I knew everything, just like now. I knew what I needed to say. I knew what I needed to convey. I knew that this gift of teaching is on me, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who's, who's the administrator of all our gifts, He is the one advising me here. I'm going to tell you this last example, and I'm finished. I remember uh, last year, I think it was, I was doing a, a conference at Global Worship Center in our Nassau, Bahamas, with Apostle Dwight Pratt and Brenda Pratt. And I was doing, I think it was Generational Curses. I think, yeah, I think it was Generational Curses. Anyway, nevertheless, I remember I'm up on the podium, man, and I'm just going. I'm just having my little iPod, you know, and I'm just teaching, man, like nobody business, taking my time and making those examples. And guess what happened? My entire screen on my iPad went completely, sorry, not the screen, the, the notes, uh, uh, the note software where I had my notes written and had them in bullet points, the entire thing just gone missing. But guess what? I didn't panic. Why? See, because I commit my time to study. Oh, I love this. Oh, boy, listen. When you realize that your gift have nothing to do with you but everything to do with the God in you, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us these gifts. 
He is the one that will lead us into all truth. But guess what? Even though I'm up on there on the stage and I'm trying to move my finger on this iPad and I cannot find my... Guess what? I tell you, I didn't need it no more. I shut down the whole thing and I just went. The Holy Spirit just brought it back to my memory, just like Jesus promised. He says that when I leave, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will send the Holy Spirit whose initial job is to guide you into all truth, to convict you of sin, and watch what he says next, and to remind you of the things that I have said. But in order for him to do that third one, you got to ingest it, get it in you. Now, because I'm an avid reader and an avid studier of the Word of God, it, it, people, did, they had no idea in the congregation that I didn't have my thing anymore. But man, I'm flowing like nobody's business. So your gift isn't about you. Your gift is an investment that God gave you that he expect a return on, okay? When you die and you transition from time into eternity, most people believe that when God judges, he's just going to judge us on our sins. Fornication, lie, and she didn't know. No, you have been given an assignment. You have been given gifts to assist in that assignment. And he's going to say, Kevin, you stand before me and I've given you a gift of teaching. I've given you the ability to break down my word that even a child could understand. What did you do? According to my books, your gifts over a period of time or do, even when you would have left the earth should have, should have win at least about two billion souls to the kingdom. But when I look here, you never used it. So, those of you listening to me right now, if you're not using your gift, I strongly suggest, I strongly suggest, even if you have to go on a fast and ask God what, this, what your gifts are, or to ask God to move the so-called impediments that's blocking you from using it, you need to because you are going to give an account. You, God may call you to be a radio announcer. God may call you to be a plumber. God may call you to be a preacher. See, not gifts don't just mean a spiritual gift. Whatever talents he would have given you, how are you using this to alter change for the betterment someone else's life? So when I do my teachings, I'm not looking for accolades. I'm not looking for raising money. I and mean, you will see that in my ministry. I'm not looking for titles. I'm not looking for someone to throw a robe on me and, and usher me in with 50 people in front of me and 90 people in the back of me like I'm some superstar. No, no matter who call me, no matter how small the congregation may be, no matter how big it may be, all I'm about is fulfilling another assignment that I have to give an account for on the day of judgment. That's the only thing I'm thinking about. Whether they pay me or not, whether they praise me or not, whether they boo me or not, that is irrelevant. What is relevant is that I have executed the word of the living God, which he has given me to share and to execute with his people. All right? So, let's get into our lesson today. Okay, what's going on here now? Whatever. And I begin to take All right. All right, here we go. All right, great. Now, today, we are dealing with... My God, boy, I love this. I, listen to me, yeah? Let me just calm down a little bit. I'm, so excited. I'm like a little child in Candy Story now. I am so excited. I'm always excited about the Word of God, but today... I am, uh, I can use a big word right now. I am inundated. Take that. I am inundated <laughs> with the joy of this teaching today. Again, we are continuing with our teaching when evil altars are raised against churches, part six. I gave you your homework last week from Numbers 22 to Numbers 24. And this, this, this teaching today, the, the foundation of it is going to be based on the events that took place in the lives of Israel during the time of Balak, who would have been the king of the Moabites, and Balaam, who used to be a true and real prophet of God, but because of money, fame, glory, he decided to cult. Okay? Now, this teaching now is going to present the basis of everything that we have talked about. However, I want to make this clear. This doesn't necessarily mean that this part six is the final on this. So the jury is still out as to whether we're going to go further. All right. 
So I need the jurors to really evaluate the case so far to see if we will continue with the uh, 7, 8, probably 9, and 10. All right? Now, in order for us to have a clear understanding of what's going to happen today, there are some laws that I want us to pay attention to. Now, I'm going to call them off because I want you to write them down because I'm going to go through them quickly. The first rule, sorry, rule, principle, law, whatever you want to call it, these are all biblical. The first one we're going to look at is Deuteronomy chapter 28, Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 to 16, okay? That's the first one we're going to look at. Then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10, and we're going to look at verse 14, then we're going to jump to verse 20 and read all the way to verse 22. So that's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14, comma. Then we're going to go to verse 22, and we will read, sorry, verse 20, and then we will read to verse 22. The third rule we're going to look at today is Exodus 20 and verse 24. Exodus 20 and verse 24. Now, let's look at these rules, which is now going to become the basis of our... Uh, our teaching today. The first rule, let me get my Bible here now. The first rule we're going to look at here, like I said, is X, sorry, Deuteronomy 28 and verse 15 to 16. And listen to what it says now. Let's listen to this carefully. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 15 to verse 16 is uh, Moses, the servant of God, who is the pastor to the church of Israel, because Israel really is the body of Christ. That will be us today. And these Old Testament stories are just giving us examples of what happened back then for us to glean from to operate successfully today. So the pastor of Israel, or the pastor of Christ back then, was Mr. Uh, Moses. And Moses is about to uh, give a rule or a principle or a law to the children of Israel as it relates to Curses. And listen to what he says. He says here, in verse 15, he says, But it shall come to pass, if thou will not hearken. So Moses, the pastor of the children of Israel, all right, they're the members of the church. So Moses isn't speaking to uh, the strip club people. Moses isn't speaking to the Covens. Moses isn't speaking to the gamblers and the, the, the illegal drug trade people. No, he is speaking to the people of God and he is about to issue some rules for them to abide by if they want to live a peaceable life and to be free from the evil that is consistently coming at them and they don't even know. So he says here in Deuteronomy 28 verse 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou will not, Israel, if you will not hearken or listen unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and to, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which are his rules, his principles, his protocols, he says, which I command thee this day, that all these curses... That's my highlighter. He says, all of these curses, now hold on now, listen to the rule carefully. He says, Israel, even though you are the people of God, Israel, even though God have a hedge around you, Israel, even though you have followed the initial requirement to become the children of God, he's saying, Israel, adversity can visit you harm, sickness, disease, your enemies oppress, all of these things that once was uh, held back from you can now have a legal access to your life, even though you're children of God, if you reject the rules, the laws, the principles of God. So let's make this clear. 
So he's telling them now, don't be shocked if you see things start breaking down on the back end. You can't get ahead. You're barren. You can't get promoted. You're sick all the time. How could this happen on a consistent basis to me who was a child of the living God? To me who was a person who attend church every time the church doors are open? To me who never missed a pay period without paying my tithes or giving offering or helping the poor. How could this be happening to me? Well, he just gave you the rules. He says, even though you are a child of God, if you reject the laws, or if you allow somebody to roll up in your congregation and say, listen, you don't need to be doing this. You don't need to be doing that. This the white man gospel. This the black man gospel or whatever they say to you. He says, now, watch this now. The foundation is being laid out for destruction for you, even though you're a child of God. I am making this rule my primary rule because we are about to show you some stuff in this gospel because it's going to dispel a lot of things pastors are preaching to their congregation. Listen, witchcraft cannot work on you if you know God. If you are a Christian, remember them telling you that? If you are a Christian... If you have accepted Jesus, no curse could come nigh you. Don't they tell you that? But that ain't what we're reading here. That is not what we're reading. We are reading that the curses are conditional. We are reading that if you are a Christian, but you decide to disobey the laws of God, then at this point, God step back and let the law run its course, even though you are a believer. So he says here, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses, listen to this carefully now, shall come upon thee and do what? Overtake thee. Hold on now, Moses, who are you talking about? Because you can't be talking about the people of God. Because based on what I'm reading here, I'm still God's person. Or children, but I can be afflicted by evil if I disobey his. God didn't reject me. No, I just decided to do my own thing. But I want you to read something else. Let's go to verse 1 of the same chapter. Moses again, speaking to who? The same children of Israel. Moses, the pastor of Israel, the bishop, the whatever you want to call him, the apostle, whatever you want to call him. He is the leader of this group of people who are known or labeled as the children of God. But listen to what he says in verse 1. He's saying to Israel, and it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken or listen diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, the somebody says now, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high, you're going to be promoted, above all nations of the earth. Okay, listen to verse 2. And all these blessings, who is he speaking to again? The children of Israel, which will be us, the body of Christ. Who is speaking this to them? Pastor Moses. That's me telling you this, or your pastor telling you, if you're reading the same thing here. So the pastor whom God has made the shepherd over the sheep or the body of Christ is now laying out the rules for them to continually prosper. And he's also laying out the rules for them to have consistent failure. So he says the blessings are not automatic. The, the, the whatever you call a good thing is not. He says, if you are listening. So as long as I'm listening to God, as long as I'm obeying him and following his commandments, I will continually see the hand, which is the blessing of God in my life on a consistent basis. Read it yourself. So he's telling the people of God, now that you are members of God's church, he says, you are not automatically blessed. He says, you are, the, you are a member, but in order to get the, the benefits of your membership, you must now adhere to the rules, the protocols, the principles, the commandments, the precept that I've settled in my laws. 
I speaking to somebody today. See, because they're telling you as long as you come to church, they're telling you as long as you sow, as they're telling you, as long, and especially if the seed is big, then this will happen. No, 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 no. I'm not reading that. What I am reading is if I follow his rules, if I follow his commandments, then I am blessed and no evil could touch me. That is where no evil could touch you. But don't tell me because you accept Jesus Christ, ain't nothing can touch you. Don't try that. Because I also read that even after you accept Jesus Christ, he now tells you to put on an armor. Why would I have to put on an armor? I think Jesus Christ was a cure-all. But it's the same way you have to obey the rules if you want to be protected so you have Jesus Christ. All right? So that's the first rule we need to look at. That's the first rule. The second rule I want us to look at now is found in our 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But let us turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Well, actually, I had it marked in this Bible. Oh, here it is. And we're going to read verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to read verse 14. And listen what it says. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from fornication. Sorry, from adultery. <laughs> idolatry. Idolatry. He says, flee from idolatry. Now, this is another pastor. This now is Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul now is speaking to the church of Corinth. Pastor Paul is telling the church who are the people of God. He said, I'm telling you not to serve other gods. In fact, I'm telling you to flee, run. We see in the Bahamas, break off, run it. Take off, run it. He says, I'm saying to you, flee, church, flee from... Church, you should have no dealings with idols. You should have no dealings with uh, paraphernalia from the kingdom of darkness in your home, in your person. You should not be reading Psalms 91 turned upside down on somebody. You should not be writing people's name on a piece of paper and put it in the Bible under a particular psalm, wishing harm to them. All of that is sorcery. All of that is witchcraft. He said, you should not be walking around with garlic on you to protect you from the spirits. You should not be pouring ammonia in your home or salt or mopping your floor with turpentine. You should be doing the, all of that as idolatry, not adultery. Adultery is being married and having an affair with someone else. Idolatry is to serve, to worship other gods. So he says in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says to flee, to run, to evade, to elude, to be evicted from idolatry. But watch what he says in verse 20. Verse 20 says, and this is Pastor Paul again, speaking to the people of God, all right, who are blessed if they continue in adhering to or hearkening to the laws, rules, principles of the Lord thy God. So in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 10 it says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, he's not talking about the people of God now, he's saying the sacrifices that those who are on the outside of the body of Christ and they are psych listen what it says. He says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils or to demons. So here it is a Christian now has a sickness, but they've been going to this church for years and the sickness is getting worse. And another member says, Listen, I know a place that you could go to, all right, a healer, a herbalist, and they can make this better for you. So you go there and this herbalist says to you, yes, we can fix this. Let us make a sacrifice and call on the spirits. But listen what Pastor Paul is telling them when you do this. He says the sacrifice that they are making has nothing to do with the sacrifices of God. In fact, he says that you are now participating in a ritual where you are tying yourself or interacting with the devils of that particular altar or that sacrifice. Let's finish reading it because you may think I'm making this up. So 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 20 says... But I, which is Paul, say, things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship, do not have any dealings with their sacrifices. Listen to verse 
He says, you Christians cannot drink the cup of the Lord. You cannot come in and take communion with us, the body of Christ. But the night before, you've been drinking concoctions from the altars of devils. This is why you have a lot of people, and I've seen this a lot in my ministry. People over the years, Christians in particular, you, 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 you visit their home to pray for them or whatever. And as you're praying... They, and I've seen this on a consistent, they coughing and vomiting up this black stuff. Why? Why the consistency of that in them? Because these are the demonic concoctions that they've been drinking over the years from these same places that they've been going to. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. And these things are running its course in their physical system. The spiritual things attached to those things that they were just running its course in there. They don't mind if they go to church. They don't mind if they go to the con. Go! But a part of us is in you. And we can do whatever we want to do. We have the right to do it now because of the law that your God put in place. That if you don't listen to him, then we the curses have the right to override you now. For someone says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. How could you? And the tables here really represent the altars. How could you be to the altar of God and then you, you, you bring in the things of the devil? He says, no, you are provoking the Lord thy God. Stop it. Now, with those three laws in place, right? I want us to go now. To Numbers chapter 22 and we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 7 Numbers 22 and we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 7 all right now things are going to get a little heated here and even though I'm outside I really should bring a fan here with a couple of ACs because we're about to get hot in fact we're about to get deep I told you last week, you're stubborn. I say, bring your scuba gear. And don't bring one time, bring two. You're going to need it. Because we're going to at least 80,000 feet minimum today. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so we're going deep today. All right? I just laid that foundation out. We're about to build now. Now, we're about to discuss Balak and Balaam. And Balak and Balaam. Balak is the king of the Moabites, all right, a wicked group of people who serve other gods and so on. Balaam was a former man of God, a former servant of God, who, who has the gift of interacting with the spiritual world, who has the gift of hearing and seeing in the spirit, and that gift was supposed to be used for the purposes of God. But of course, as we're about to read this account, he instead used it for the devil, but he tried to mix the two, just like he was asked, it was commanded not to do uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 20 to 22. Alright? So, now that I laid that out, let's begin to read this story, and let's make some sense out of it as it relates to our teaching about evil altars raised against churches. So, in Numbers chapter 22, beginning at verse 1, and I'm going to take my time here, because I really need you to get this. And it's going to speak volumes about, your, and again, this teaching isn't just for the church. This is a biblical rule principle for the church, for the individuals who are, are home, family, community, country, your job, place, wherever. Numbers 22 says, and the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho. And Balak the son of Zippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. Uh, Israel prior to this in uh, Numbers 21 had just destroyed these two superpowers, Og and Bashan and all of them, ripped them apart. So at this point, uh, Balak, the king of the Moabites, realized that he cannot physically, th this is key right here, he cannot physically 
destroy Israel. And that's just how people who are raising altars right now, that one individual or group in that church, all of us together physically cannot fight all of these people who love their pastor, who love their church. So how could we deal with them, not only to be successful in defeating them, but how could we do it without we're the ones doing it? Oh, this is about to get hot. So verse 2 says, And Balak the son of Zippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was so afraid, they were afraid of the name of Israel, because they know how these fellas don't play. They were so afraid of the people because they were many, meaning Israel, and Moab were distressed because of the children. Listen, Israel ain't even coming after these dudes, you know, but they already stress out because they know Israel is a mighty superpower who is being fueled by God Almighty, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Joseph. The invisible Almighty God is the armor to Israel. And their enemies notice, and you hear what the scripture, your enemy, I keep telling people this, your enemies are more afraid of you than you are of them. Their, 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 their plan is to make you ignorant of the power that you have to succumb to their evil. So as you can see here, Moab was afraid of Israel. Okay, so what happens next in verse 4? And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, now they're having a consult, how are we going to deal with this? These fellas marching up here, and more than likely, because they outnumber us, because of their greatness, they're going to shut us down. So we now need to concoct some plan, come up with some form of counsel to be proactive in dealing with them. Now you see this? You see even where the enemy is proactive, and the Christian just sitting down lazy, well, well, well we can be, you know. If it's God's will, it can happen. No. Look at your, your enemy understand the, 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 the rules of warfare, that you need to be proactive if you have any inkling of winning anything. So verse 4 of Numbers 22 says, And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licked up the grass of the field. And Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. Verse 5, he sent messengers, hello, he sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt, behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Oh, I love this piece. Moab realized that they could not defeat Israel physically. They say, you know what? Let's call one of their own against them. Oh, oh, watch this now. When evil altars are raised against your church. Let's, let's get someone who live among them. Not only that, let's not just get anyone. Let's get someone who have an understanding of of the spiritual realm. See, we ain't picking, they ain't went and get the mechanic, they ain't went and get the carpenter, they ain't went and get the painter. No, 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 no. Let's get someone who understands from their group that there are things that you can see that is dictating the course of what you do see. Let's get someone who have a good understanding in this to shut down his. You only hear me. to you. Don't haphazardly jump on you. No, 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 no. This fellow working according to the plan, they proactively set against you way before the physical war even start. So he says, let's get someone who is well versed as it relates to spiritual things. Watch this now. It says, he sent message for unto Balaam, the son of Beor to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against us. Verse 6. Come now, therefore, I pray thee. Balak, the king of Moab, saying, Mr. Balaam, come here and curse these people. Oh, listen to this. 
He didn't say come here and physically shoot them. He didn't say come here with an army of men to stab them with spears. He didn't say come here and burn them out. No, 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 no. Nothing physical he wanted Balaam to do to Israel. This man, God have mercy on people listening to me right now. This is why I am consistently preaching about things that are spiritual. Because your enemy is way more advanced than you in this area. He said, Balaam, to what he didn't went to Balaam, who he knew have 60,000 men waiting to, to fight for him. He didn't went to Syria. He didn't went to Damascus, to no place to get physical armies. No. He said, Mr. Balaam, I hear you is the best voodoo priest ever. I hear that your Santeria is outmatched with anyone else. He says, now come here and place a spell to disable Israel spiritually so I can have the advantage physically. You know what I mean? I tell you it's going to be hot. I told you from the beginning, even last week, I said, this is going to be hot today. Bring your scuba gear. Now you're getting drowned out in the ocean and this, this shouldn't happen. Put on your scoop, put your snorkels up in your nose because we're going even deeper. <laughs> okay? He says, go and get this man whom we know have a command when it comes to the things of the spirit. See, this is why I can, I can do a little intermission right here. You can't be caught up on these prosperity messages. You can't be caught up on these sowing seeds. You can't be caught up on spinning around ten times. No, let's get into the meat of what's happening here. And what is happening here is entirely spiritual in its initial stages to attain physical victory. Balaam, Moab, the Midianites understood this because they serve evil gods. They made... Uh, uh, and enchantments and the works calling on spirits to do their bidding and they have been successful in it all their lives so now they say let us call someone who's an exploit in this who's among their own though the Israelites watch what happens now verse 6 Balak sent messengers to Balaam Balak is the king of Moab Balaam is the prophet who was a, a once a true man of God but you can also see in the story that even in his backslidden state God is still speaking through him. So this is where the scripture now says that the gifts of God are without repentance. You don't have to repent and say, God, forgive me. And God say, okay, now here's your gift. No, you had your gift from the day you came into the world. Now what you do with this gift is totally up to you. All right. So verse 6 of Numbers 22 says, come now, therefore, this is Balak speaking to Balaam, his message. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse Curse me this people. Come and curse Israel. Now let me break this down. What he's saying here now, he says, listen. Release a spell. Release an enchantment spiritually over Israel so that they will be disabled physically. Come and put a curse on Mary, a curse of infirmity. That even though Mary was healthy and living well, high blood pressures are fine, heart rate is beautiful, her blood test came back perfect. But I need you, I want to be in Mary's position. I want to be the boy. I want to be the pastor. So come put a spell on them. So now strange things are going to take place, but they don't, they, they, they don't know why this is happening to them. But they don't know that we sent a curse on them. So he says, now come shut Israel down for me, but do it initially spiritually. Because the spirit, I have repeat this over and over. The spiritual world dictate the course of our natural world. Your spiritual life is dictating the course of your physical, natural, everyday life that relates to your five senses. I cannot repeat that enough. So he says, come curse these people. For they are too mighty for me. Physically, they're too much. Physically, they're too strong. He says, pre-adventure, or suppose I shall prevail that ye may smite them and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessed is blessed and him whom thou cursed is cursed. So basically, what is being said here is that Balak, the king of the Moabites, is saying, listen, Balaam, come here. Because I heard some great things about you. I have been told that you are so good that whomever you bless is blessed. 
and whomever you curse is surely cursed. So I'm asking you to come, give me an advantage over his. Paying him for this voodoo charm, paying him for this enchantment he's about to release. Just like when they go to the old bear man for you, they got to pay with the reward of divination. How much it is to fix Kevin and to shut him down? 60,000? We don't care. If we got a teeth to get us, this can take. We pay the, the reward of divination. What reward of Paying or making sacrifices against your church. Oh. So the Bible says that and in verse 7 of Numbers 22, it says, And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the reward of And the donkey, I like this piece, it says, and the donkey spoke to him. <laughs> now, let me tell you why I can camp with him. Witchcraft and sorcery, I, I give you the scriptures, right? And people shut me down. Pastors, I always say people, let me take that back. My, my greatest opposition is to church people. The word. But... They say, no man, Kevin, man, let me tell you something. Kevin, if you don't believe in those things, some things don't work, man, why are you telling these people? I say, yeah, I say, okay. But you believe the story that a donkey had a conversation with a human. You believe that a man had a conversation with a dumb be That if we could get things altered in the unseen world through sorcery in this case, then we will have an advantage over Israel. They understood that. So they now summons a man of Balaam to come and curse because they've heard great things and many success stories of him. But not only that... Then I advance the story and go to verse chapter 23 of Numbers, verse 1, where now Balak has now answered the request of Balaam. All right? 
to come now and curse Israel. But here's I want to make clear before I go into this. The mountains, a group of people are now seeking demonic evil spirits. They're about to raise some altars to, to summon spirits to now disable them. They have no Uh, land of Moab to perform his rituals and evil. So verse 1 of chapter 23 of Numbers says, And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me... How am I going to call these spirits? How am I going to summon the evil spirits, the demons, the unclean spirits, the spirits of confusion, busyness, from a demonic perspective to summon invisible forces against a person, place, or thing and make uh, negative things happen in their life that no one would understand except for us who's doing it. What, what do I, what protocol must I follow? Well, it's telling you right here. It says that when Balaam, Balaam got there, he says, listen, he says, build me seven altars. Hallelujah. He said, build me seven altars and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. Set up seven altars. The number seven speaks of perfection. So this spell, this incantation that he is about to perform, this supposed to work. Sacrifice that they sacrifice. Who are they sacrificing it to? Devils. So based on the second rule. So watch this. So in verse 2 says, And Balak, which is the king of Moab, Moab did as Balaam the prophet had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered or made sacrifice on every altar a bullock and a ram. And Balaam Corinthians 10, 22, 10 to, sorry, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20 to 22. We read that. So I'm showing you step by step that the things that are being spoken of, spoken of in these chapters that I'm reading, they're not happening because they had nothing else to do. They are following a rule, a law, a pattern to invite greater things to happen that would not happen under normal circumstances.
So this is why I'm saying to you over and over, if you don't know the rules of the Bible, and when I talk about the rules and the law, I, I, I always forget to do this, but let me make this clear. When I speak about the law of the Bible, make no mistake, I am never speaking about just the five uh, books of the Bible, the initial one, which is from Genesis to Deuteronomy. No, I'm talking about the entirety of the Bible. The entire Bible is the laws of God, the rules and his principles. Because here it is we're reading now where something that happened in the Old Testament that was spoken of, the rule or the pattern or the foundation of it is being followed in, De- in uh, Numbers chapter 23. So this is why I'm always leading you back to the scriptures because the scriptures are the laws. These guys are operating by spiritual laws in order to make things change from a physical perspective. They realize if they tweak things in the unseen world, the rule is changes must come in the natural world. They understood this. Only the Christians still trying to figure this out. Only this Christian is trying to bring up doctrine and gospel that have nothing to do with these rules. And this is why they're not going anywhere. This is why they're not growing. They're not advancing. This is why cancer is wiping them out. And they always broke can't pay their bills. This is why any time a company is owed anybody, it's normally the Christian on the list and not the sinner man. No. So what I'm saying to you is if you're not dealing with these matters from the spiritual, you failed already. So the scripture says here, In verse 3, And Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by thy burnt offering, and I will go. Suppose the Lord will come to me, to meet me, and whatsoever he show me, I will tell thee. And he went to a high place. Verse 4, now listen to this. And God did meet with Balaam. Mm -hmm. See, remember now, he still, as far as God is concerned, still have the gifts of God to hear and to see in the spiritual realm. God ain't taking that from him because he decided to, to mix up himself with sorcery. No. It's like many of you. Many of you have great singing voices, even though you're singing for everyone else except for, the, for God. Many of you have great skills and, and, and math, great skills and accounting and whatever. God has called you to whatever, but you decide to use it for evil purposes. God ain't gonna take it from you because you decide to use it for evil purposes. No, you still have the but. But you have to give an account on the day of judgment as to what you did with it. That's it. So, so, so the scripture once again says, I think it's, uh, I think it's first of Second Corinthians 11 verse 29. I'm not sure. You can check it out. The gifts of God are without repentance. I don't have to say, God, I am sorry. Forgive me for my sins. Now, have me, now let me have my gift of teaching. No, you had that from day one. Now, what you do with it is a different story. All right? Now watch this. The scripture now goes on to say here, And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth, this verse 5, And said, Return unto Balak, and thus shalt thou say. And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the prince of Moab, because they wake now, okay, we know this fellow hot, what he got to say? He can send lightning from heaven and just take down Israel. No. Watch what he says in verse 7. And he took up his parable. This is Balaam now, the prophet. He took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, had brought me from Aram, out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, which is also Israel, and come and defy or challenge Israel, which is the body of God, or Christ. Verse 8. He says, How shall I curse... Jesus, I love this piece. How shall I curse whom God had not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord had not defied? Let's put a pen right there because I have to explain this part of it so that you don't become confused. So, Balaam, the evil prophet, is now saying to Balak and all the consul of Moab, they're waiting, okay, what are you going to say now? What else do you need us to do to send this curse? He says, listen, you brought me out and you asked me to come curse these people. But he said, but I, I, have to, I have to give you a spiritual rule to make you understand why my spells are not effective. And listen to what he said. He said, I cannot curse whom God didn't curse. This can make sense to you right now. You know why? Let's go back now 
to Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1. Who is he talking to again? This is Moses speaking to who? The children of Israel. Now, when Balaam say, I cannot curse whom God did not curse, who is he speaking to? The children of Israel. Watch this now. And Deuteronomy 28 verse 1 says, If you obey, hark, and observe to do all my commandments and my laws, watch what's going to happen, then shall the blessings come upon you. Who's the blessings coming from? God Almighty. So, Balaam is telling Balak, listen to me, I don't have the legal right to curse Israel right now because they are blessed. God did not curse them. You know why? Because they are following his rules down in the, in the valley. Even though we are here trying to work the most witchcraft on them, it cannot work. There's no loophole to get them because they serve in God. They're not committing adultery. They're not lying. They're not cheating. They're serving God in spirit and in truth like he asked them to. So therefore, they are not cursed. He didn't curse them. The only way they could become cursed is when they go against his law. And the law, which is God, now curse Israel. So now we will have an opportunity to curse them. But what am I saying to you in so much words? If a church is under evil altar spells, if the pastor is under a spell, if people in that, church is, in that church is being afflicted through witchcraft spells, through sickness, disease, going crazy out of their mind, divorce, don't let's blame the witchcraft people now. They only do what they're supposed to do. What is the loophole? What rules are you breaking that is giving these evil workers charge and advantage over you? Yeah, I know you won't hear that. Yeah, I know you won't hear that. Because see, you won't blame everything on the old bear man. You won't blame everything on the fella who working. You See, this is what you call giving them credit now. Not my teaching. Remember, let's go over the rules again. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let's go to verse 58. If you decide not to hearken, and I'm paraphrasing it, unto the voice of the Lord thy God and to do his commandments, what is the voice of the Lord thy God? His word, which is him. He says, then shall these come you. But as long as you're doing what God has called you to do, I don't care how much witchcraft they send on you. I don't care how much things they plant in that church. I don't care what they bury in your yard. It cannot affect you. If it is affecting you, then your hands are to evil also. Don't have to be witchcraft. It could be a lying spirit or you could be lying. Li and, 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 and this evil I'm speaking about is iniquity. These are unconfessed evils in your life. You, 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 people look at you as a beautiful, nice Christian person. How could this be happening to you? But nobody sees in your heart. God says, I'm judging them by their heart, full of hate, full of anger. So now Balaam would say, now we could, we, could, we, could, we could release the curse now. Now the curse can take form because there is iniquity in their heart. Even though they look like they got it all together on the outside. So I'm saying to you, man, if you don't know the rules, you're going to be getting whoop and you're going to blame God. And you got people talking the same nonsense. Man, when God can turn this thing around, man, look like everybody doing evil, they get in the hair. And look like the people who serve in God ain't going nowhere. That's a lie. Straight from the pit of hell. Stop lying. Stop your stinking lies. Go read the rule book. Go study the rule book and you will see where you're coming up short. You're coming up wanting. You will see why the enemy have the upper hand over you. So going back here now, he says to him, he says, I cannot curse. This is verse 8. How shall I curse whom God have not cursed? God ain't cursed them. There's no curse in them because they're living right. So I can't curse them. But he's saying I'm not above God. God is the supreme ruler. I can't curse them. How can I challenge or defy them? I can't if God ain't doing it. God judgment have to be on them first. Remember in Malachi chapter 10, you all like to use this one when you have one, all this tide and all this other stuff. Oh, for you are cursed with a curse because you have robbed God. What does he mean curse with a curse? Well, if you go up early in the chapter, Israel was serving idols, which automatically levied a curse on them. Now they weren't paying the tide, which was a curse on top of a curse. So the first curse of serving idols gave the curse of not paying the tithes leverage over them. 
So what am I saying? There have to be legal ground for supernatural evil to work against the believer. It just can't jump on you. Let's prove this further. In Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2, I think it's part B, it says the curse without a cause cannot affect you. There has to be legal ground. This whole earth, the physical earth and the spiritual realm, uh, there, are, there are rules, there are laws. And thank God that they are because if they weren't, then any devil could jump in you and possess you. Any devil could take your wheel while you're speeding on the highway and run you into another car or run you off a cliff. Any devil could just inject AIDS on you or inject sickness. No, there are rules, there are commands, there are principles, there are precepts that they have, they have no choice to abide by. And that's why I feel so confident when I minister. And I don't feel no way preaching against which is evil because guess why? The rules will continually pertain. It ain't that they ain't sending curses at me. They've been sending curses at me, but they're ineffective. Why? Because Kevin doing, living the life God asked him to live. Does that mean Kevin no sin and Kevin is perfect? Lies. Never. I'll never admit that. No, but it does mean that Kevin is on a consistent basis repenting to give no leeway for evil to take hold of his life. No. I understand. I understand the spiritual rules. Many people don't, and that's why they're suffering today. That's why they're blaming everybody except themselves. So watch this now. Let's drop to verse 11. Verse 11 says, And Balak, which was the king of the Moab, Moabs, said unto Balaam, What hast thou done unto me? I pay you all this money to come work witchcraft on these people, and you talking fool, but you can't curse them. <laughs> That's what he's basically saying here. He says, And Balak said unto Balaam, What hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. Verse 12 says, of Numbers 23, And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord had put in my mouth? This part here is very interesting to me, because what this does now is, is it now begins to shine the limelight on those in the church who have the appearance of righteousness. The prophetess, the prophets, the apostles, the ministers, the, the lay ministers. Now, what the scripture is saying, because Balaam fit the part of someone who was advancing the things of God. I picture him as someone in the church right now that because he attends the church all the time, because he's good in the prophetic, everyone just say, this here, this, this, a man, this is a man, M-A-N-D, this is a man of God. But yet, we're seeing here where he, a lot of the things that he's doing, he's mixing it with the things of the enemy. That's like you go to be a prophet or some elder in the church. And you say, man, every night I feel like this person's coming in my room. And mind you, you know this person, this prophet to be quote unquote on point. And the prophet say, you know what? Here's what to do. Tomorrow morning, get up very early and go down to the beach and get a gallon of the sea water and mop the whole house out with that. Now, right there, you know what you should say? Now, hold on now. Now, prophet, I believe you you are a man of God and all of that, but you want to share a scripture with me where I can support what you just told me, which he cannot. So right there now, that's where you begin to weed out. Now we begin to see who is now serving altars. Where you, where you get that from? He's saying, now, if that don't work, and I believe it will, now go down to the local pharmacy and buy some spiritual turpentine and you mop the whole place out with that and get some ammonia and put it in blah 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 hold on now wait sir I, I never read this where you get where, where are you getting it from see now we are beginning to see those who are serving altars hello now we begin to see those just like Mr. Balaam who mix in righteousness with unrighteousness now we begin to see the laws of God where God says, why sit to the, bring to the table of God the, 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 the devils to the tables also? Now we, when we begin to go by the rules, now our eyes begin to open as to who these people really are. 
Why every time I tell you something wrong with me, you say it's witchcraft, it's old bear, and now you will give me a witchcraft old bear antidote to deal with it. Not go pray and read my Bible. And if you do advise me to read the Bible, you tell me I must turn Psalms 91 upside down on them. Or I must get a particular Psalm and write it down and put their name and put it in my shoe. And as I walk on them, that signifies they're under my feet. Yeah, what scripture is this again? See, now it making sense. A lot of the omens that our ancestors subscribed to, yes, Grammy loved God. Yes, Grammy was good at, at singing the hymns when she home and always telling us, get our life with God. But every time there was a problem, Grammy would resource stuff that have nothing to do with God. We'll be looking at another Balaam. We're looking at another Balaam. See, when we read the rules, it can all make sense. How is it that Grammy was saved all her life, served God all her life? And the rule book said, according to Psalms 112 verses 1 to 2, listen to what it says. It says, praise ye the Lord, and blessed is the man that feared the Lord, and delighted greatly in his commandments. Well, this look like Grammy. This sound just like Grammy. And watch what it says next. It says, now because of that, this person's seed, which is their children, grandchildren, and go forward, shall, not might, shall be mighty upon the earth, and the generations of the upright shall be blessed. So this sound like when Grammy served God, and she feared the commandments and all this other stuff, her children should be blessed. But when we look at this, all of the children curse sickness disease anti-marriage hardship anti-promotion but this don't make sense according to the law god promised according to psalms 112 verses 1 to 2 that the seed of grammy should shall, shall be mighty they shall be blessed and all of them curse oh 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 hold on now because we're looking at the law now and we're using the law as a benchmark to assess spiritually we ain't judging Grammy, we judging her spiritually. The Bible says, He that is spiritual, judge it all things spiritually. And that's what we do it. And we find Grammy coming up wanting. Grammy suffered with high blood pressure and disease all her life. Grammy, how could this be when the God of Abraham you serve all your life? We used to hear you in the morning praying that the heavens down you used to come anoint us. But now that I'm understanding these rules, Grammy, I remember one time I was looking for something under your bed and I saw this pan with these candles in it. Oh, oh, now, Grammy, now that I see, now, why are you always went out to that tree at a certain hour in the evening? And it's like you was praying to the tree, but it really sounded like you was talking to the tree. Grammy, why, how come you insist that all of your children your grandchildren navel string to be buried in this particular spot. Uh oh. So you see, we, we're hitting on some stuff now, you see? We're hitting on some stuff right now. We're hitting on some stuff now. See, this is reality. This is true teaching. See, ain't no more naming and claiming here. Ain't no more spinning around seven times and a Mercedes Benz gonna pop up on your, your driveway. No, 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 no. We are now unveiling, hello, the secrets of darkness. That was mingled up with the things of God. Furthermore, and I'm going to end with this piece here with this. Grammy, you always told us about Jesus publicly. You always prayed aloud in the morning. You always tell us to anoint ourselves and plead the blood of Jesus. You did that, Grammy. I must say, you are a good Grammy. And you told us we should get close with God. Grammy, you told us that we should make God number one. But Grammy, I get that. But why, why, okay, if that's so, Grammy, then what this thing under your bed meant? How come you never told us about that? Why were you burning white candles on these papers with people's name on it, Grammy? How come you never tell us that we must do these things too? At least you don't tell us yet. Grammy, Sally, you serving two masters based on what Minister Kevin showed us here in the scriptures. And that ain't right. I got to wonder now if Grammy even going to heaven. Oh, oh. I told you this teaching was going to be hot. I, did, 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 did I not tell you? 
So now things are making sense. Why is the church cursed? Why are families cursed? Why are communities cursed? When we look at the biblical rules and protocols and the commandments of God and use them as the benchmark as to what's happening, now we begin to see with true spiritual eyes the core of what's going on here. So the Bible says that, I'm going to run through this right now, it says that Balak had summons this man to come and curse Israel. The first time he did it, he says, I cannot curse these people. And the second time, in fact, I'm going to run there right now. The second time, the second time, uh, let's go to verse, let's go to verse 13. Let's go to verse, verse 13. Let's go to verse 13 of Numbers chapter 20, 23. Verse 13 says, And Balak said unto him, which is Balaam, Come, I pray thee, with me unto another place. So I'm going to take you to another angle so you can get a better view of Israel to curse them. Probably you just need to be positioned different so, you, so these curses could really, don't mind this, this God thing you're telling me about because if God ain't cursing them, you can't curse them. That's rubbish. Come over here. Come to the north. Now you got a good look. You can see them, right? Now I lay them curses out now. So verse 13 says, And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee, with me unto another place from whence thou mayest see them. Thou shall see but thou shalt see but the utmost parts of them and shall not see them all and curse me them from here verse 14 and he brought him unto a field of zophim to the top of pisgah and watch what, what what is he going to do now and he built seven altars and offered or sacrificed bullock and ram on every altar so what is he doing again? He's now summonsing spirits. All right. Now, so far, this is the second time. These are now 14 altars that has been uh, built. And the spirits has visited these altars. Now, there is one more rule that I didn't give you. And I bet you didn't pick up on that. Because remember, I told you I had three rules for you, right? But they, I, I intentionally not give you this one. But I want you to turn it there now. Turn to Exodus. Turn to Exodus 20. Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to keep our finger here in our numbers. So we're going to look to Exodus 20 and verse 24. Hope you're enjoying this, man. I really hope you're enjoying this. This is going to be, bring plenty of insight. Now we're going to look at a law or a rule or a principle of the altar. Here's what it says. Exodus 20 verse 24. This is God speaking now. And he's telling Israel the type of altars that they need to raise in order for him to come as a spirit. And a part of this principle of God visiting an altar is that he now brings blessing. And we all know that because it's a principle, Satan also acts on this. So he requires the same thing. He needs also an altar to enter the earth and have legal right. Not say enter it, but have the legal right here. He needs his people to raise altars just like what Balak and Balaam is doing. But the opposite happens in this case. In this case, when evil altars are raised, evil spirits, just like it was mentioned in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 20 to 22, evil spirits are, 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 call, are called upon. So in Exodus chapter 20, verse 24, it says, An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon. Now, this is an altar unto God. Sacrifice thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen, in all places where I record my name. And what's going to happen as a result of this? He says, then I will come unto thee. The offerings, the burnt offerings that you're doing at this physical altar is going to summon the Spirit of God there. And he's not going to come empty handed. What he's going to bring? He says, and I will bless thee. So altars of God, and we're going to do a segment on this. Where I'm going to tell you what an altar of God is, how you erect one, how you perform and worship at that altar. So God says, when you raise an altar unto me, he says, I will visit that altar. God is a spirit, meaning that I'm not going to see him, but he is there. And from this point forward, the blessings of the Lord is going to come. So therefore, that being the case, when an evil altar is raised, the opposite happens. Evil spirits, demonic forces, strongholds, principality rules that altar. And that altar requires a sacrifice to summon that spirit. But this is the key. 
curses, no matter who is operating that altar, no matter which witch, warlock, or wizard, no matter who's coming there seeking solution, Christian, non-Christian, and the like, they all will be cursed there. Every last one of them. Curses are going to be levied on them. So that is the third rule on this teaching that we have here. So now, I'm only, I only told you that at this point of the teaching because remember, this is the second time Mr. Balaam has now raised an additional seven altars. So these are now 14 altars that has been raised and he was summonsing spirits. But I want you to notice, it wasn't that the spirits weren't coming. The spirits came. They came, but the spirits couldn't affect Israel because Israel was following the principle of Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 to 2 to 3. That if you hearken and listen unto the voice of the Lord thy God, then shall these blessings come upon you and overtake you. Israel was also benefiting from the law of Proverbs 26 and verse 2, which says that the curse causeless cannot come, meaning that Israel was down in the valley serving their God. Israel was down in the valley repenting of whatever sins that they were engaging in, so the devil had no legal right. No obey could work on them, no voodoo, no witchcraft. Yeah, they plant things in the yard. Yeah, they put things to their front door. Yeah, they put pennies on their desk and pennies to the front of their door. And on the they did everything possible and they're frustrated because they're spending thousands of dollars to jack up your life, to jack up your marriage, to jack up your promotion. But you continue to serve God in spite of how things look. As a result of it, the laws of the living God will protect you. The laws of the living God will shield you. Hello. So 14 altars are now erected and those evil spirits, hundreds and thousands of them. But they know they got to abide by the rules. They have no choice in the matter. These are rules from the God Almighty, Elohim, El Shaddai, Jehovah Mekadesh, Jehovah Sidkanu, Jehovah Adonai, Jehovah Jireh. This is his rules. No God, no idol, no devil, no demon could supersede the laws of God. That's why I say to you over and over, once you understand these principles, if any evil is working on you, at some point you are a co-conspirator to your own demise. It's as simple as that. At some point, at some point you are a co-conspirator. Co-conspirator means that there's some evil, some rule of God you are breaking, which gave these forces the evil right to come into your life. So, verse 14 says that, uh, an altar, another set of altars were erected. Let's go to verse 14. And he brought him unto the field of Zophim to the top of Pisgah and built another seven altars and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. And he said unto Balak, Stand here by the burnt offering while I meet the Lord again. And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go again and tell Balak and say thus, and when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering, and the princess, plural, of Moab was with him. And Balak said unto him, What had the Lord tell you this time? Verse 18 of Numbers 23 says, And he took up, meaning that, and Balaam took up another parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto, the, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Had he said it, he shall, had he said, and shall he not do it? Or had he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment of bless, and he had blessed, and I cannot revoice it. Lord, they are there right now. Lord, I done spent all this money on trying to shut Minister Kevin down. I sent all kind of spirit to his house. I do everything to cause problems with his car. I did this to his wife. I did everything to his children and none of it is working. You know why it ain't working, Mr. Obey man? You know why it ain't working, you pastor Susan and Christus at me? It can never work because Kevin know the laws. Kevin know the rules. Kevin understand the principles and the order of God. And Kevin has applied them every day. He repent of his sins and the sins of his family. Every day he outfit them with the whole armor of God. Every day he subscribed to Job 1 and 10. 
and place a hedge of protection. Every day he's covering his family on a consistent basis and every day he's doing his best to adhere to the laws of God and repenting on a consistent basis. It will never work. Now guess what's going to happen? Kevin says send him back. Send, wherever they're coming from, that's why you catching all the hell right now. The same hell you sent to Kevin, the same hell is coming to you. Why? Because the altars that you are calling on are altars of devils who, who come accompanied with curses and the curses are levied on all of y'all who is against the man and woman of God. You will fail at every junction. You will be defeated and exposed at every corner that you come at because Kevin know the rules. Kevin understand the principles. Kevin is a lawyer in the realm of the spirit articulating the laws of the living God. Appropriately, if I might add. Let me tell you something. The most powerful Christian is a Christian who know the rules. The most effective Christian is the one who apply them. The most powerful believer is one who walk in the confidence of the Lord thy God based on the scriptures, not his own arrogant way. Someone need to hear that. Someone need to hear that. Someone need to hear that. It's working on you because there's sin in your life. It don't mean that you commit sin. It don't mean that you are engaging in sin. Check your history. What did mom and them do in the past? What did the fourth and, fourth and fifth generation before you engaged in? Selling the future generation off to idol gods for luck, for prosperity, for riches. But you have no knowledge of this and you're suffering the effects. However... The dreams are coming where you're always back to your parents' house. You're always in your school uniform. You're always with some former. All of this showing there are altars working against your life and they have the legal right because of the injunctions levied against you through your ancestors. You need to know the rules. You could cry Christian all you want. But you defeat it because you don't want to play by the rules. You don't want to play by the laws of God. When you don't play by the rules of God, you lose. And I keep saying this to you. You could call yourself a Christian all you want. You could give yourself all the titles. You could give yourself all the titles that you choose to give you. When they're calling you to come preach, this is the right honorable Doctor, Reverend, Apostle, Bishop, all of those things don't protect you. Show me one person in the Bible whose title protected them. And I'll show you a thousand whom the rules of God that they applied protected them. So your, your, your titles, your position, the size of your church, the monies on your account will not protect you in the realm of the spirit. Your understanding of the rules and the laws are what is what God put in place to protect you. And that is what's going to continually protect you. So, let's finish read this. And this is what I like. Let's start from verse 19. It says, this is now Balaam speaking to Balak. And of course, Balak is not happy yet because he has spent some hefty dollars in summonsing uh, Balaam to come and curse Israel, particularly after hearing of all of the accolades that came along with and the recommend the high recommendation that came along with uh, summonsing Mr. Balaam. But in verse 20 it says, he says, Behold, I have received, now this is now Balaam the prophet speaking to Balak, the king of the Moabites, who called him to curse Israel. He says, Behold, I have received commandments to bless. And he had blessed and I cannot reverse it. So God says, Israel is blessed. I'm telling you that now, Balaam. So you go back and you tell Balak, you can't curse him. I got him covered. And I ain't got them covered because that's what I want to do. And I doing it because I is God. No, I am doing it because they're following my rules. And the rules will always protect them. Yeah. I remember telling someone the other day, we were having a discussion. Let me put a finger here. And they were telling me about all the... In fact, we ended up meeting because they were watching my videos even in the workplace and my original video, Witchcraft in the Workplace. And they were saying to me how they're cheating them on the job and lying on them and so on. I say, hold on. All you must do is stick to what God say, but more importantly, as it relates to your job, that is. Not more important, I shouldn't say that, but policies of that company. 
the policy is the rules, the regulations are to protect you. They might seem as if they're getting away because they're not doing it and the managers or the, 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 the directors are encouraging it and they seem to be, don't worry about that. If they tell you, you pick up the paper every morning, that's a part of the policy, you pick up the paper every morning. Even though the, 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 another, the next 10 who work there with you make 11, ain't doing it, don't worry about that. The policies are to protect you, just like the spiritual realm. The rules are to protect you. It will always appear as if those who are against you are getting away because of favor and advantage. That's how it always looks, but that's just to lure you in. But don't mind that, reject that. Follow the rules that are in place. When you go before HR, when you go before human resources, personnel, you know what they're going to look for? Let's see if you follow the rules. Now, you might have a case against John. But you was doing the same thing John was doing, disobeying the rules. So guess what? You can get the same thing John can get. So following the rules is important. So in verse 21, now it becomes powerful. This is what he says. Now this is Balaam the prophet now still speaking to Balak. He says, he had not beheld. Who was he? Capital H. Who was he? The prophet Balaam says, he which is God has not observed iniquity in Jacob. Please highlight that scripture, which is Numbers 23 and verse 21. So Balaam now is giving the reason why God keep telling these jokers, you can't curse my people. He said, I do not see. Remember, he is the righteous judge. Even though we are Christians, God ain't going to take our side because we are Christians. He is going to take our side and defend us when we follow his rules. Just like I told you about the workplace and human resources. Human resources will fight for you as long as you are following the rules. Are you following the rules of God? And don't tell me, yeah, because I'm going to tell you you're a liar if all these woes are upon At some point, the rules are being broken. And again, it don't necessarily have to be something you're doing. This is why I teach extensively on generational curses. Check your lineage. Who was serving Freemasons? Who was involved in Eastern Stars? Who was involved in secret societies and working magic? Who? Because this is what God calls serving other gods. And as a result of it, listen what the rule says, because Grammy and them was a part of the Eastern Star, because Grammy and them was a part of the Lodge, because they was involved with secret society and working black magic, white magic, uh, Wicca. Oh, it's not evil, it's just Wicca. You're serving another god. He says as a result of that, according to... Uh, Exodus 20 verse 5 and uh, Exodus 37 and verse 5 I think it is it says he says the, 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 the sinner will not go guiltless for I will visit their iniquity upon the children current ones and all the way to the third and fourth generation so the fourth generation was showed up four generations later they catch an all kind of hell in their life and they say how this happened I, I am a virgin I don't have sex with no one I, I love God I I take part of communion, God, why is life even harder for me? Because I read in here that only if iniquity is in our heart and so on, then these evil will come upon us. Then what's happening, God? God said, you're not reading all of my laws. Why are you only picking up part of my laws? Didn't I say to you that the sins of the parents will fall on you? Well, now go do your research and see what your parents are all about. And if you still can't find your research, begin the process and the protocols of what I told you in Leviticus 26, 40 to 41. What did he say? He said that you must now repent of the iniquities, the transgressions, and the sins of your forefathers, ancestors, and yourself. So all this time you're just saying, oh Lord, whatever sin I do today, Lord, please forgive me. And you're trying to figure out why evil still happening. Because you have left the iniquities, the wickedness that your ancestors died in and never repented of. They are still weighing and levied over you and your seed and will continue to go on until someone break it. So anyone who tells you generational curses, that is, God has abolished that since Galatians 3, where Christ become a curse, they obviously don't understand the full context of the laws. Their interpretation of the rules are misguided. It's as simple as that. 
So in verse 21 of Numbers 23, it says that God had found no iniquity in Jacob, which is also Israel, which is the body of Christ, which is the children of Israel. He has found no iniquity in Jacob, neither had he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Hallelujah. Mighty God. Well, listen, if God could open up your eyes in the spiritual realm and show you the forces for those of you living right and confessing your sins on a daily basis and trying to do your best to follow the rules, commandments, protocols and principles and, and, and precepts of God, if God could open your spiritual eyes and see the, the horde of evil spirits that want to crush you, who hates you with an eternal hate, you probably want to ask God to take you home right now. But I know, trust me, trust me, oh, they sent them. I wouldn't even go into the details of things that I experience, but there's no fear here. There's no anxiety here. There's no panic here, okay? Because God trained me for this over the years. Through all of the other things that came at me, they were training sessions that prepared me for now. So tr do tr listen to me, and I can tell you all who continue to do your nonsense. You are investing heavily in the lives of your children and your future seed, but negatively when you come up against the true men and women of God. Oh yeah. And I even gonna run to that scripture, touch that mind on I even I in fact I even gonna bring that up right now. But what I'm gonna bring, he says, he says, I will visit your iniquity, your evil that you're doing to Kevin, your evil that you're doing to that man in his church up the road, your wickedness, where you have no fear for God and to work sorcery in the house of God or against the people of God. God says, Not only will I deal with you, but your iniquity will continue to be the punishment, the penalty of that iniquity will fall upon your future seed. And many of you are living today, watching so much bad things happen in your life, happening, your grandchildren getting shot down like dogs in the street, getting their heads blown off, getting crushed and knocked down. And you say, Lord, why all this adversity? Remember the evil you did to other people. Now the rooster coming home to lay the eggs now. Now it's harvest time. You won't talk nonsense. No, no, don't work like that. These are, you, 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 you allowed the spirit of hate and bitterness to dictate the course of your life, to shut Kevin down, to shut Mary down, to shut Susie down, to shut Peter down. The devil was just pumping for nonsense in your head and just carrying out everything that he's been able to do. Knowing that this same devil is seeking solution, the same one who's going to cause these curses to be carried on your life. So continue, continue to make your remarks, continue to send your hate mail, continue to sell your, send your curses. Every last one of them will be revoiced to you, not because I want to, because the scriptures say so, the law say so. It's as simple as that. So the scripture says here, and I want us to get to this piece here, in verse 22 of Numbers 23, God brought them out of Egypt, and he had, as it were, the strength of a, and they have as a, the strength of a unicorn, as long as you serve God, your strength, your power is being backed by the God of Israel. Boy, I love this here. Yeah? Now, I love verse 23. Oh, I love this. Oh, let me do my little happy dance right here. I love this piece. I love this piece. I love this piece. Verse 23. Hallelujah. Listen to what it says. Surely there is no enchantment. There is no spell. There is no hex. There is no negative words. Listen to this carefully now. Against Jacob. So what does that mean? As long as I live and do what God has asked me to do. As long as I address the generational curses in my life, in my family lineage. As long as I repent of my sins on a consistent basis. There is no Obed. There is no Santeria. There is no witchcraft. There is no enchantment. The things they plant in my yard. The things, the attacks, they try to come at me in my dream. God says there is no enchantment against me. You all hearing this? So this now stands to reason. Well, how come the enchantment is working on Sister Mary? How come, the sp how come everybody got it right? I hear they fix Susie. And it working? How could it be working? I'm reading here because Israel... God found no iniquity in them, because this seemed to be the key here. It says that there is no enchantment, no evil could, be, could befall them. 
So if Sister Mary and Sister Tom in the, in the hospital and their right leg swell up and they can't go down and they say, I hear she walk on something or he walk. Well, if they walk on it, and let's say it is true, how come it work it? When we're reading here, there's no enchantment against Israel. Only if they're following the rules, the principles, the laws, the protocols of Jehovah Elohim. So, see, see, now that I'm breaking the law, now it's making sense. Kevin, you don't know what I've been through in my life. All my life, I serve Jesus and I can't. No, oh, no, no, stop it, stop it. Because I have to throw some laws on you. I'm a lawyer down the courtroom. I won't defend you, but you got to be honest. Okay? We're going before the righteous judge because he's the ultimate judge. Satan is going to bring his case against you. The Bible says he's the slanderer of the brethren. We expect him to do that, but don't let him find nothing on you. So start confessing. Father God, my great grandmother was involved in sorcery. I repent. You start dealing with these things because when we go before the judge, we want the judge to see where our slate is clean for us to win this case. So don't come talking no mess to me, man. So verse 23 says, Surely there is no enchantment against Israel, neither is there any divination against Israel. No matter what they sense spiritually, they can't shut you down. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What had God done? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion. Now, of course, at this point, Balak is hot, right? Now, let's drop to verse 26 of Deuteronomy 23. Because remember now, you don't pay this fella at least two, three million dollars to come break half a pound of OB on these people, right? <laughs> and ain't nothing. All he doing, like he on Israel's side, because that's how I would appear. And he keep talking fool, but God tell him this and God tell him that. He say, look here, I ain't pay you to tell me what God tell you. I pay you to put a curse on these people, so I'll have the upper hand in the physical realm of them. So in verse 27, in verse 27 of Numbers 23, it says, And Balak said unto Balaam, Meaning that I hear nothing you telling me. He says, I pray thee, I will bring thee unto another place. Pre-adventure or suppose it will please God that thou mayest curse me them from hence. Now this is an interesting piece of, piece of scripture again, which kind of correlates with the previous ones in that they keep mixing Almighty God with the witchcraft, divination and enchantment. They're trying to work against Israel. Isn't that interesting? And that's why I tell you, a lot of people, excuse me, in our churches today, who claim the name of Jesus verbally, and just why Jesus said, but their hearts are far from me, because they're still tied to tradition. Well, Mama said, when you come home late, you must walk in the door backwards, so no spirit could come behind you. No spirit could come behind me? Well, who's this Lord supposed to be protecting me, that he can't take the spirit off me, and I don't have to go through this ritual? See, now it begin to make sense. The things that you were subscribing to were instructions from evil altars that, they are, that them and their ignorance went along with, and now they're passing it on to you. So you find yourself, you children, you tell them the same nonsense. They have their children, they tell them the same. But nobody's going by the real rule book. So the scripture says that now Balak is telling him, maybe, maybe you need a different position. So verse 27 says, And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, I will bring thee unto another place. Suppose it will please God that thou mayest curse me them from there. Verse 28 of Numbers 23. And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor that looked towards Jeshum. Jeshmon, sorry. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me again another seven set of altars. Listen to this now. So we have now a total of what? 21 altars. And each individual altar, there was a ram and a bullock that was sacrificed, meaning that they were sacrificing it unto demons, unto devils. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 to 22, they were calling on evil spirits. Again, according to Exodus chapter 20, verse 24, these evil spirits that came to the altar, because remember in Exodus 20, 24, it shows the principle of an altar, but God, but from... God's perspective, he's telling Israel that when you build the altar that I have called you to build it and where my name is, I, God who is a spirit, will visit it and bring blessing. So the principle of this altar is that once an altar is erected, depending on which deity you're serving now, in this case with Balak, these evil spirits now are coming, but they're coming laden with curses. 
So, so far, we have a total of 21 altars corroded with evil spirits of death, of sickness, of confusion, and everything. They're there. It isn't like they're not there. They are there at these altars. You cannot see them, but they are there. But they cannot proceed any further because the people who they are being sent against are following the rules of God, are following the commandments of God. So watch what the scripture says here now. So back to verse 28. Verse 28 says, And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor that looked towards Jeshimon. And Balak, Balaam sorry, said unto Balak, Build me seven altars, and prepare me here seven bullocks and seven ram. And Balak did as Balaam said, had said, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. So every altar, based on the rules that we have read so far, every altar is saturated based on the sacrifice with demons, with devils. And again, we get this rule and this understanding from 1 Corinthians 10 verses 20 to 22, and also Exodus 20, 20 to verse 24. So each altar with a sacrifice, there are not 21 altars, but each one of them have evil spirits, with evil voices, evil sacrifices. And they're all prepared to attack spiritually Israel, which is what Balak, the king of the Moabs, originally wanted. He says, if you could send these demons and cause them to think and behave in a different way, now we could come and that they are spiritually disabled and overcome them physically. But he couldn't do it because in verse 21 and in verse 23, it says that there was no iniquity found in them by God, and therefore no enchantment or no spell could work against them. So the key or the principles that we're extracting from the scripture is that if there's stuff going on in your life as it relates to altars, be them raised against the church, raised against you, the pastor, whomever, if it's working, it's only working because iniquity has been found in you. But I will add to that is that it don't have to be your iniquity because of generational curses and the things that your ancestors, the penalty of their iniquity is now levied on you. So you must now repent and fast and pray against those things. All right? In verse, th in verse in chapter 24 of uh, Numbers, verse 1 says, And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not any more as at other times to seek for enchantments or to seek to place spells on them. But he sent his face, sorry, but he set his face towards the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes. He saw Israel abiding in their tents according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Well, I'm not going to read the more that because it's going to now tell you about he's going to prophesy the judgment that's about to come on uh, Balaam, sorry, Balak and the Moabite people because of the curses that they were trying to send against Israel. So again, this is another nugget. You're going to see now that after, because you're living right, and even though they're sending curses at you, it might affect here and there, but guess what? After the time limit on that is done, and you read the rest of the 24th chapter of Numbers, you can see now where all of this is going to now be reversed back on the children of Moabite and so on because of what he was trying to do to Israel. But... And I'm going to finish right here. There was some advice that Balaam the prophet gave to Balak in order for him to have victory. Remember, there are now 21 altars. The spirits didn't go back because they couldn't go forward. The spirits are still there. This is the rules of the altars. But the spirit are restricted because of the laws of the altars. Meaning that the people who were being sent against, the land that we are sent to curse, the community or the country, we, we, we're here, we've been legally brought here, but we cannot affect them because there's no iniquity in them. So Balaam the prophet said to Balak, he says, you know what? And I'm paraphrasing this. He says, you need to get Israel to engage in evil. The minute they engage in any form of evil and don't repent, then all of these 21 altars with all the spirits that I've called here will now go forward and do what we originally wanted them to do. So what did he say? Well, the scripture makes it clear that the Moabites had very attractive women. So what they did is they enticed Israel men to now come and sleep with them 
Now, what is happening now? They are breaking a rule. What is the rule? God originally told the children of Israel, he says, now listen, when you go into the promised land, he says, do not let your daughters marry their sons, and do not let your sons marry their daughters. And watch what he says now, and you make no covenants with them. Sex is a covenant. This is why I speak about having sex in the dream to being so evil. When they start to have fornication and sex and so on, read the rest of the story where hundreds, thousands of them, the men of them died out. When evil altars are raised against a church, when evil altars are raised against a person, when evil altars are raised against a community, there is always a pattern of negativity. If you're going to a church right now, and this is one of the signs that you know there are altars in that church, not against it, there are people in that church who serve the devil and not God. When you decide to leave and they say to you, if you leave this church, you are cursed. If you leave this church, you will die. If you leave this church, you will not prosper. That is a church that serves Satan. On the outside, they have all of the trinkets that make them appear as if they serve in God. But that statement there alone, particularly if they consistently say it and try to bully you and intimidate you to stay there by making condescending or even remarks or curses, they are working under an evil power. That's nothing. It has absolutely nothing to do with God. You need to get away. If you are in a church where the pastor is vain, full of himself, have homosexual tendency or traits, and every time he make an example or he discussing something, he never ever uses the Bible. He just go on ranting and ranting. That is a church that have evil altars against it. And I could be in there also. When you in a church and the membership is always having negative dreams about the church, particularly, I've mentioned this before, a lot of the dreams have to do with evil, creepy, crawly stuff, bugs, uh, snakes, crabs, uh, centipedes, pythons, especially if you see them wrap around the church, especially if you see them in the church, or you see like dark shadows in the church or outside of the church, or you see the church building, it have like the walls, there are cracks, big cracks in the walls, and you have like creepy crawly things coming out, snakes, centipedes, and, and stuff like that. Sorcery is the order of the day of that church. If you see the, 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 the administration, all right, falling sick to sickness and disease and cancers and just dying out, evil altars are against that church. And more than likely, the people who are doing it are in leadership. If you see you have prophets of that church, and this is how you know the prophet is involved with evil altars and not the things of God. If that prophet, if 99% of the things that they prophesy is negative, damnation, death, oh, I see death, I see four caskets, I see where funeral procession, if that's all you are hearing for the most part, that prophet is serving evil altars. They're deeply involved in sorcery. They're mixing the two, just like what Balaam was doing. And as a result of that, it's going to bring curses. Remember, I cannot use this example enough. Uh, Achan and the children of Israel when they came to Jericho. Because only Achan did the evil, God judged Israel uh, 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 collectively. So you have to grab a hold of the rules. Say right now, Father, cause me to be more cognizant of the rules of your word. Let me not be brainwashed into the 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 the, un, the 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 evil preaching that the laws only represent the first five books of the Bible. The whole Bible is your law. The whole Bible are your rules. The whole Bible is your entire precepts and commandments. So Father, open up my eyes in a Genesis. Open up my eyes in a Revelation. Open up my eyes in an Ezekiel. Open up my eyes in a first, in, in first John, second John, Saint John, Matthew, Luke. Help me to see this Bible as the rules that govern the physical and the spiritual world. Help me, God, train me. Cause me to be cognizant that me as a Christian is a lawyer in the spiritual realm, articulating the right rules, laws, and principles as it relates to what's coming against me. Or to even tap in and cause that which has been set aside for me to come to me.
How do I do it? One of the rules of that you will found, find in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 30 to 31. And it says that if the thief be found, the spirit that has been robbing you all your life, it is in your marriage, within your finances, it says that he must return unto you sevenfold. You now must do that. You must cause him, command him to return unto you. The law give me the right that once I would have discovered Satan and his evil spirit stealing out of my life, I must command him to return unto me. Not just what they originally stole from me, but to return at sevenfold. Another rule in the Bible is found in uh, Isaiah 54 and 17. We say it all the time, but the last part of it we ignore. It says that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Good, fine. We always say that. I get that. But watch what the authority of the law gives us. It says, and any or every tongue that, tongue that has risen up against me in judgment, the enchantments they're sending against me, the spells, the curses, he says, now I must condemn that. That's a rule. That's a law. That's the principle of God. So if your church is not spending 95% of their time on those pulpit, those, their time in Bible study, if they're not keep pulling you back to the Bible, directing you to the word, this is what I do. I'm always using scripture. If I spend the most of my time teaching you, taking you to scripture, telling you about a Paul, telling you about a Peter, telling you about a Moses and Ezekiel, showing you the things that happen in their life. While they may just be parables or story, when you look deeper, invested in that story of Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, or whomever, are the laws and the rules and the principles of God that he wants you to abide by to consistently be a uh, uh, flourishing in the earth and succeeding and achieving. That's the only way it's going to happen. So say right now, man, pray with me. Father God, I thank you. Thank you for this session right now that we've had where your wisdom, where your knowledge, where your spirit of understanding, your spirit of counsel and might has been articulated in such a way that even a child could understand it according to Isaiah 11 verse 2. Father, I pray according to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, that everyone listening to this video in the future, even now, that you will automatically impose upon them the spirit of revelation, Father God, so that even when they read your word, they don't just read a story, but you through your Holy Spirit will now articulate them of the rules and the principles that are being adhere to or even rejected in the scripture that is giving us the final result of what that scripture says. Let your people become cognizant. Let your people become aware of the spiritual laws so that they would be more effective, not just primarily in the spiritual realm, but that because of it, they will dominate the physical realm. Cause your people not to be overcome by pomp and pageantry and all of these other rules that are totally non-biblical that they're being asked to adhere to. Cause them to expunge that from their understanding altogether and to grab a hold and love your word. I love your word because your word declares according to Psalms 119, I think it's uh, verse 98 to verse 100, it says that for your commandments and precepts and laws and rules has made me wiser than my teachers. So Father, I bless you. Father, I honor you. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the glory of the living God over this understanding today. And that this understanding that was so delicately broken down for your people, that they will take it and run with it primarily or firstly in their spirit. I pray, Father God, that they will see immediate. Lord, hear me right now. Let them see immediate manifestation of the application of your principle. Let them see that their lives were hindered and delayed, not because you took too long, not because others said it was in their season, but because they were not appropriating the right rules, laws, principles, and commands of the Lord thy God. Your word declares, Father God, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1, 2, and 3, it says that if they hearken and listen unto and to observe all that your rules and laws have said, then shall they be blessed, and the blessing shall overtake them. So, Father, I pray right now that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the one that you say will lead us into all truth, then let your Spirit of truth dominate 
the people that choose to hear your word, the people that want to see change in their lives, the people who are sick and tired of the same old, same old. Give them the audacity. Give them what it takes for them to rise up in the realm of the Spirit and become committed to your laws, to your rules, to your principles, which will make them no different from an Ezekiel, an Isaiah, Jeremiah, or whomever else. Father, we bless you. Father, we praise you. And Father, we ask these things in the matchless and the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Now, we're going to end this right here today. I have a lot more. I have a lot more. And today is supposed to be the final teaching on when evil altars are raised against churches. Now, like I said to you on the last video, right? I said that it will really be up to you if you want me to go on. And I trust me, I have... I could do 50 more days because I have a lot more revelation. But here is what I want to say to you, though. My next teaching series is going to be on healing. Healing. And we're going to go deep into the scriptures, man. How do we uh, accurately and appropriately uh, unleash the rules and the laws of God as it relates to healing? And how healing can be uh, achieved at a greater and faster rate as opposed to now when we apply the true rules of God. The Bible says very clearly, it says that, uh, uh, it says that because of the stripes of Jesus Christ that, that we are healed. The Bible says that, that God, he is one of the names is he is our Jehovah or Rapha, the God that healed us. Uh, in Psalms uh, uh, 102 and I can't remember right now, we talk about uh uh, healing again. See, what we're going to do, just like what we're doing now, we're going to take our time and we're going to go through to the rules first. What are the rules as it relates to healing in the Bible? We're going to make a list of that. That's what I'm going to do. I've already done it already. Then we're going to now go into different stories in the Bible with different people. And I'll give you an example of one of them. Uh, in Luke, in Luke chapter 13, it speaks about the woman who had the spirit of infirmity for 18 years. But there were some principles that Jesus administered in his delivering of this woman that break off of her a spirit, not a physical illness, a spirit that had her incapacitated, mimicking a disease. We are going to look at the rules that brought about Jesus' end result. And these are the rules that we are going to use now. We're not just going to walk around, oh, blah, 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 blah. We're speaking in tongues, oh, turn it around, Jesus. Oh, heal us, God, la, 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 la. We ain't into all that Kool-Aid stuff. What we into is, is doing the will, the word of God in the right way according to the manner in which the protocol set it out to be, and you're going to see healing. I learned this years ago when I first became a Christian. And this was back in 1990. I used this story all the time. I remember I was home one time. Me and my son, this was a Friday night. And it was raining cats and dogs outside. It was raining so much, I couldn't even see my vehicle. That's how heavy the rain pour was. I realized that my son had a burning fever, so much so that he was about to pass. So all his eyes almost began to roll in the back of his head. And I became very angry. I was a new Christian, but I was, like I said, I studied a lot. I didn't just listen to what the pastor said. I literally went home and studied even beyond what he was telling us. And I remember applying uh, Matthew, I think, 18 and verse 19, where it says that wherever two or more of us touching anything shall ask of the Father, it shall be done in heaven. Anyway, I remember my son KJ. Uh, kid is about three, four, something around there, whatever. And I said, I remember holding him by his arms. And I mean, the boy just swinging where he's so sick. He have a burning fever. I can't rush him outside because it's pouring rain. I need to get him to the hospital. And I said to him, I said, KJ, do you believe that God can heal you? I'll never forget this. And he looked at me and he said, Daddy, yes, uh, and that's all I wanted. I was following a principle. I was following a rule. And I said, Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus, according to your word, and I believe it's Matthew 18, verse 19. And I quoted that word. And God is my witness as I stand and look in this camera today. I have no reason to lie to you. Less than five minutes. My son who was, I mean, the only thing I didn't see was flames coming from him. That's how high this fever was. The fever literally left him. Period. This boy running about the house like nobody business. I'm sh and when I look back at it now and I see what's happening today and people who's carrying these diseases and sicknesses for years who have taken it on so much so that when they talk about it, they say, my diabetes, my cancer, my HIV. No, no. 
you are going contrary to the laws of the living God. So in my next series, we're we'll going to be talking about the mystery of healing as it relates to the Holy Scriptures. We're going to dominate the series, man. So you tell me. Put out the list of this. Kevin, I want you to leave this and go on with the healing scriptures. Or Kevin, give us at least a couple more of the series of When Evil Also Are Raised Against Churches. And I'm going to obey you and I'm going to follow whatever you say. God bless you. God keep you. God let his face shine upon you. I pray that you are continually praying for me and my family. I thank all of you who have been blessing me tremendously. And I've been doing great things as a result of it. And in, and, and in advancing the ministry as you can see. So you have a great day in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.